DOD, IG and the ICIG are going to have their their meetings with with Bachet and Luna. Even if Grush isn't present, they are going to discuss some of his his testimony. And frankly, of course, one of the questions will be, well, who who is trying to evaluate these claims? Because for all the complexity, part of it's very, very simple. All you have to do, if if you believe that you have knowledge of these legacy programs, whether they're crash retrieval programs or reverse engineering programs, all you need is three pieces of information. What's the name of the program? In what agency or private company is it embedded? And who's running it? And with with those three pieces of information, which frankly you could relay without actually segueing into to divulging any classified information, with those three pieces of information, pretty much anyone in Congress could then really do some proper oversight because you'd know where to look and who to ask. The problem with this previously was that no one knew where these programs were embedded. For years, people were saying, oh, maybe it's CIA, maybe it's NSA. Turned out, of course, with ATIP, it was DIA. I'm not a scientist myself, but in parallel with people like Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo, Professor Avi Loeb at Harvard has has invited me to be part of the Galileo project. And so like uh, Lou and Chris, I sit on the Galileo project as as a non-scientist, as a, a research affiliate, and we help the science team and hopefully use some of our our background and knowledge and experience of this subject from within government to help Avi and his science team. The following is my conversation with Nick Pope. Nick is a journalist and media commentator and ex-Ministry of Defence employee responsible for, among other duties, investigating the UFO phenomenon to determine if they had any defence significance. For those interested in the UFO UAP subject, Nick is as close to royalty as you get. And to those with a passing interest in the subject, his face will be familiar with involvement in ancient aliens, UFOs declassified. Uh, Nick also wrote a book, Open Skies, Closed Minds, which was an autobiographical account of his interest in ufology. Prior to requesting Nick on this podcast, I'd spoken to him before and conducted, um, when I was conducting investigations into uh, the UAP uh, UFO subject with um, Freedom of Information Act requests in the UK. Despite his busy schedule, he was always quick to respond with a wealth of advice and knowledge, a genuine gent and a really lovely person to speak to, an absolute encyclopedia of knowledge in his head. Um, He's been deep in this subject for, for many, many years the perfect guest for the UAP Files podcast, some would say. So the following is my conversation with Nick Pope. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Nick. How are you? Yes, very well, thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much for, um, for joining me. I really appreciate your time. Um, if it's okay, I just wanted to sort of jump in. Really, I've, obviously, we we um, we see you uh, all over the place within the sort of UFO community with regards to TV shows and uh, and stuff on um, on news sort of analyst, uh, analytics of, of some of the events that happen. Um, sure. If it's if it's okay with you, I just wanted to sort of jump in uh, and kind of go back really to where it all sort of began. I think I know a lot of people will will know of you from sort of the Ministry of Defence over here in the UK. Um, but I guess it, 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 it is that kind of where it started for you, or did you have an interest in the field prior to that? No, I had no prior interest uh, at all. So it really was the Ministry of Defence that was the genesis of all this. I was a civilian employee there. They move you around uh, just the standard posting policy every few years. And it was, frankly, a matter of luck that the vacancy on the UFO desk came up at almost exactly the same time that I was due for a move. Now, I had worked directly for the manager uh, concerned. We, we'd we both been seconded into the Air Force Operations Room in, in the Joint Operations Center during the first Gulf War. So I actually knew the individual who headhunted me in, but uh, it wouldn't have worked without that 
coincidence of of the move and the vacancy pretty much coinciding. So so I I was uh, brought in to do that job, which I did for three years. And uh, as I say, prior to that, I had no interest in this subject, no no particular beliefs either way, actually. So I think looking back, that was the best best situation because I don't think it's a job that you would want going to either a, a true believer or a diehard debunker because I think I think then you would find your own confirmation bias. I think you want you want a neutral. You want someone going in there with a, a blank sheet of paper and taking a data led approach. Did you find obviously when you when you're in you know working for Ministry of Defence, I suppose a lot of the things I would I would assume that a lot of the things that you kind of that come across your desk, you would think, well, that's potentially a sort of foreign adversary that you know technology belonging to others and and some of these weird and, and unusual anomalies. What was the you know was there something specific or did it get to a point where you thought, hang on a minute, this this might not be um, you know human technology. This might be something else. Well, it's interesting because the the whole point about adversarial technology, you, you hear a lot about it nowadays, particularly in relation to what's going on in the United States. People routinely talk about those U.S. Navy videos, for example, and they say, could it be our own tech, some sort of secret black project technology being blind tested on one part of the military by another in a situation where if you said it's a test you wouldn't get that real world reaction that that you'd want but also people say uh, is it russia is it china something like that actually when when i was doing that job in the 90s in the ministry of defense although that theory about adversarial technology was was one of the things that we were obviously considering and and concerned about in percentage terms it was a tiny fraction because i mean the the sheer difficulty and rarity of of that kind of situation happening particularly with the technology being as it was in in the 90s as opposed to now it made it most of what we were looking at was misidentification of of much more ordinary objects and phenomena i mean literally aircraft lights weather balloons meteors satellites bright stars and planets that sort of thing. Now we we see in the news, of course, from time to time, Russian aircraft fly into the UK air defence region to to you know for geopolitical reasons, but also to try and calibrate our air defence radars and and evaluate how good our response is. And, and we don't necessarily respond straight away because then they'd know where the line is, and and it's a game of cat and mouse. But but those sort of things, although you hear about them, it's it's not like they're happening every hour of every day. So the number of times, uh, you know, some some sort of uh, Russian reconnaissance aircraft flies up across the North Sea and gets gets into our airspace and things, it's it's not it's not as common as as maybe people think in relation to explanations for UFOs. So. So yes, it's an important aspect of this. And with Chinese spy balloon, for example, we're now asking ourselves, have we missed previous cases because of this sort of lazy, closed-minded, bureaucratic, it can't be so it isn't mindset on UFOs? Has China been able to take advantage of that and say, well, if people perceive this to be a UFO, even if they report it, it'll be ignored by the authorities and therefore they can get away with things. Um, have we missed a lot of that? Some, I think, but, but I still, I'm not convinced having done this job from the inside that it, it's a you know substantial chunk of what we're looking at here. Okay. The same, have... same with our own technology. People say, well, you know, could it be our own technology? And sure, we have things that w- you won't see at the Farnborough air show for, 10, 15 years or something, but you tend not to fly that over the heads of the public where where they'll be in a position to photograph them and and, and therefore 
you know, compromise the program. These these sorts of things will be tested. I mean, in, in the UK, they'll be tested out over the sea at night in, in some of the ranges and danger areas. In the US, they would be tested at places like Area 51. From watching you, you you take a very anal- analytical approach, and you you know you you sort of look at the data and, and very sort of data driven in a sort of scientific way, and 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 I'm kind of I'm interested in in your um in what kind of a direction you've over the years you've kind of gone in because you've you've spoken to all sorts of witnesses and you've seen all kinds of data you know some insider stuff from from back in your time in the Ministry of Defence and also you know the TV shows and stuff and you've spoken to some of the real key people. And I'm I'm really interested in your your take on what this could represent, what this could be. Have, have you kind of have you kind of narrowed down your your kind of opinion on it at all? In a sense, I haven't. And and this is a little bit ironic, I think, because sometimes I look at people in the UFO community, wherever they may sit on the spectrum, from you know, true believer, die diehard debunker, and I, I see very often what I describe as a sort of finger pointing certainty in, in a lot of those people, you know, they'll, they'll absolutely tell you, Oh yes, this is what the UFO phenomenon is. Whereas the irony is that those of us who've looked at this on the inside are often a little bit less sure. And that's pretty much where I am. And I I think one of the most important, phrases in the preliminary we've had two now but the preliminary assessment done by the office of the director of national intelligence here in the u.s uh published june 25th 2021 was the line where they said look there's there's not going to be a single definitive solution to the ufo mystery chances are there are a lot of different things going on in in parallel and we we've discussed a couple of them already of course our own tech and adversarial tech those those will be parts of the solution the extraterrestrial hypothesis may also be part of the solution i've certainly not eliminated that i i think it is worthy of very serious consideration but i'm not going to tell people it's it's kind of proven because clearly it's not well not not to my satisfaction i guess there's a degree of personal relativity here in terms of where people set the the evidence bar and 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 even in that situation where does where does strong evidence become in somebody's mind definitive proof and that will vary from person to person so i'm i'm not there yet in relation to the extraterrestrial hypothesis, but neither do I rule it out. I think it's a strong contender. I think it's one of the most interesting and important potential solutions to to the UAP mystery. And of course, neither has the US government taken it off the table. And you can, sometimes they'll say it directly, such as when General Glenn Van Herc, uh, who heads up NORAD, was, was asked that very question by Helene Cooper from the New York Times in the aftermath of the Chinese spy balloon uh, saga in relation to some of the other shoot downs. She asked General Van Herc, have, have you eliminated the extraterrestrial hypothesis? And his answer was, well, I'll, I'll let the intelligence people speak to that. But speaking personally, I, I have not eliminated anything. That's where I am. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Um, what what do you make of what do you make of the sort of change in um sort of the change in conversation with with sort of government where previously you know this was a sort of laughed at and and now you know the white house is saying this is this is a threat we need to take it seriously we've set up a new office arrow etc cetera, etc cetera. What, what what do you make of the sort of change in direction from from kind of a, a comical piece in the news and in in in, uh, in in congress to a certain extent previously and and in in government in general to to now this is a serious issue well i think the serious side to this has always been there and certainly i had very good visibility of that when i was working on this within the ministry of defense and i was i was fortunate of course because of that background when i interacted previously with the media on on stories like for example the declassification and release of of most of the 
British government's UFO files, that 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 was very often played straight by the media. But you're right. You know, the the stigma is still there. The ridicule is still there. The fringe aspects of this phenomenon are still there. Not so much in the United States. And and you're right. That's where it is genuinely very interesting because whatever you think is going on, whatever you think the answer or answers are to the mystery, this transition from fringe to mainstream that the subject has had in in the last six years or so, starting, I think, pretty much everyone would agree with the New York Times breaking the story of ATIP and the US Navy videos. But Everything that's happened since then, those U.S. Navy videos, hearings in Congress, reports from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the NASA study, uh, the the pilots and radar operators speaking out, sometimes under oath in, in congressional hearings, the fact that we have multiple UAP provisions in the current defense bill, uh, the big National Defense Authorization Act in the U.S., and more to come in the 2024 Act, that is extraordinary, whatever one believes about the phenomenon itself. And that transition, I think, has several strands to it. Firstly, it took lawmakers to step up to the plate on this, a handful of them at first, people like Marco Rubio and Kirsten Gillibrand. But now we have many, many more in both the Senate and the House. And I think there's always got to be someone who goes first, and that's often a lonely place given given the, the ridicule that can attach to this subject. But the politicians here have been pretty smart about it, and they framed their interest very much not in terms of the extraterrestrial hypothesis, but just in, in straight defense, national security, and flight safety language. And they've said, look, we don't know what's going on. But whatever it is, it's been seen by pilots, tracked on radar, come close to some of our civil and military aircraft, to, to some of our other strategic assets. Um, we need to find out what's going on. And that's a safe play, I mean, particularly flight safety. There's no one who's going to get criticized for thinking and saying that flight safety is a concern and that if there's an issue, we should tighten things up. That's Nobody is going to knock you down for saying that. So the, the interesting thing is the disconnect between what's going on in the US, where we've had this fringe to mainstream transition, and the situation in the UK, and even in other Five Eyes nations. Um, the, the Five Eyes Intelligence Sharing Alliance has had at least one forum on UAP. But um, the the reaction from the other five eyes nations has been lukewarm when indeed they've commented at all i mean you've been you've been deep into this subject for for a very long time and i think there's a, there's probably a whole new generation of people um who come into this because of some of the stuff that's coming out in the press and in congress whereas previously they they may not have paid much attention to it do you, and and obviously there's 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 so much history and and, and incidents of, of note that were, that are quite compelling. I'm interested in your take on what you found uh, one of the most kind of compelling kind of cases in uh, over the years that you think might be interesting for people to to look at. Well, I think although it can be a real rabbit hole, the Rendlesham Forest incident is is certainly intriguing. December 1980, um, sightings over three consecutive nights at RAF Bentwaters and RAF Woodbridge, US Air Force bases on British soil. Witnesses included the deputy base commander. There was some physical evidence in terms of, of brief uncorrelated radar targets, but also markings on the ground where on one of the three nights something came down. And, and certainly, again, uh, an, an audit trail of US and UK government documents, which confirm, for example, things like the fact that radioactivity levels at the landing site on the first night seemed significantly higher than the average background. And that last phrase is a direct quote from, from one of the Ministry of Defense 
documents, um, the provenance of which is not in dispute. These these documents are on the National Archives website. It's not like anonymous stuff circulating on on the internet. This is this is the real deal. So so that's an interesting case. The Cosford incident from March 1993, multiple sightings over the UK over a period of six hours. Um, police witnesses, military witnesses. Sightings at two Air Force bases, again, uh, Cosford and Shawbury in the Midlands. Uh, and, and again, the the whole file for people who want to, to check this out. It's on the National Archives website for a small fee. It's They're mirrored on, on John Greenwald's Black Vault website where people can access them free. But it's all it's all 100% in indisputed in terms of the, these being the genuine files. I mean, heck, I know I wrote some of them, so it's, <laughs> they're they're all out there, and uh, and and people can people can do a deep dive. But of course, I mentioned the declassification and release. We we've put about sixty thousand pages um, out there. And and uh, most of it, of course, is fairly r- routine. A lot of most of it is going to turn out to be aircraft lights. And and as ever with this stuff, the best place to hide a book is in a library. The good stuff's in there. You just got to work for it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, um, Nick. Thanks so much for your time, mate. Are you um are you working on anything at the moment that you can talk about? Well, I I'm doing um, various live events. Actually, one of the things that I'm I'm doing most of at the moment is is Ancient Aliens Live, which is a 90 minute live stage show based on on the hit TV series, and it's myself, Giorgio Sukalos, William Henry, David Childress, and Travis Taylor, and we tour around the United States. We've played about 30 shows so far i think we've got another 20 25 maybe 30 uh coming over over the next um few months and it's it's a great way to take this message out to people because we we do some of the the modern ufo material but we also tie it back to some ancient mysteries and we try and do that that thing that the tv show does as well where we try and both inform but also entertain people so i'm doing that but i'm doing i'm a regular commentator i i live now in the united states i've lived here since 2012 i know and and regularly talk to and and meet some some of the people that that i'm sure you know the names are well known that you'll see testifying in congress and and working behind the scenes to move this forward. So even though I no longer work for the the British government, I'm still, in one sense, you never really leave. You're still kind of plugged into that network of people, some serving, some retired. Uh, but you, I, I mean, heck, I'm still in the Ministry of Defence fantasy football team or, or <laughs> actually one of the, you know, um, not doing very well this season, I have to say, but there, there you are. But... But I'm still there's a a network of of serving and retired government, military, and intelligence community personnel, and obviously, as you can imagine, on this subject, it's quite niche. So it's a small, it's a a small little club, and I'm I'm hooked into to and part of, I guess, that club. And we talk, and and so I I do. I'm fortunate I have a mainstream media platform, which I use. So very often you'll see me on TV news shows here in the US and actually occasionally back in the the UK. I still get asked by by the BBC and Sky News and 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 such like. I was I was on the Today program fairly recently and um, I, I regularly speak to journalists on British newspapers. So I try and keep this I try and keep this in the public eye. And and so I'm I'm doing a mix, a mix of things. But also I'll 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 finish up by saying one of the things that I'm actually most most proud to be a part of. I'm not a scientist myself, but in parallel with people like Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo, Professor Avi Loeb at Harvard has has invited me 
to be part of the Galileo project. And so like uh, Lou and Chris, I sit and on the Galileo project as as a non-scientist, as a, a research affiliate, and we help the science team and hopefully use some of our our background and knowledge and experience of this subject from within government to help Avi and his science team. And, and I think what what Galileo project is doing is is great because he Avi has a great saying, which is, well, you can't classify the sky. And and I think there's no getting away from the fact that clearly a, a large part of what government is doing on this subject is still classified, although there are efforts underway, of course, to get this declassified. We've got whistleblowers like David Grush coming forward. Congress is evaluating that testimony, I think, um, literally tomorrow as we speak. Representatives Burchett and Luna from the House Oversight Committee, and maybe maybe one other, are meeting with the. I think it's the. Uh, it's either the Intelligence Community Inspector General or the DoD Inspector General. To obviously, and they've got meetings with both. It's just I've, I've momentarily forgotten which which meeting is tomorrow and which is is uh, yeah. you know. I think it was a, a few weeks. DoD, time. I think, is the most recent. Right. I saw was the one tomorrow. Yeah. Right. Well, now my understanding is David Grush won't be present at that. And we've we've had, of course, this debate about whether he can get into a skiff and give his testimony. It's a slight red herring. I mean, a- anyone can go into a skiff. Even if they no longer hold a security clearance, if all you have to do is be signed in, and for whoever's managing that situation to make sure there's no classified material um, on on display, but you could take John Smith off the street and sign them into a a skiff if you wanted to. So, so that's that's going on, and and as I say, there are these efforts to to get some of this declassified, but it's it's very confusing. And and I know I, we've we've kind of sl- slightly wandered off topic with this, but I, I think it is interesting because it's interesting but confusing because the, and people in the UK don't necessarily always have visibility of how the just as in Parliament in the UK there's this split between the House of Commons and the House of Lords in the US Congress there is the the Senate and the House of Representatives. And so you have the Senate and the House looking at the UAP issue, but also you have a multiplicity of committees looking at this in both houses. So you have the armed services committees, you have the intelligence committees, and you have the oversight committees. So it's a little bit confusing. There are question marks over, as I say, who can tell who what, because it's not just who has a current security clearance in terms of the whistleblowers, it's who they can legally talk to because you've you've got to find the right people. Even though there are provisions about this in the current defense bill, but but you throw all that together and it's very complex. But it's all it's going forward. Uh the the DOD IG and the ICIG. Are going to have their their meetings with with Burchett and Luna. Even if Grush isn't present, they are going to discuss some of his his testimony. And frankly, of course, one of the questions will be: Well, who who is trying to evaluate these claims? Because for all the complexity, part of it's very very simple. All you have to do, if if you believe that you have knowledge of these legacy programs whether they're crash retrieval programs or reverse engineering programs, all you need is three pieces of information. What's the name of the program? In what agency or private company is it embedded? And who's running it? And with with those three pieces of information, which frankly you could relay without actually segueing into to divulging any classified information, 
with those three pieces of information, pretty much anyone in Congress could then really do some proper oversight because you'd know where to look and who to ask. The problem with this previously was that no one knew where these programs were embedded. For years, people were saying, oh, maybe it's CIA, maybe it's NSA. Turned out, of course, with ATIP, it was DIA, which wasn't where people were looking. And for much of the 80s, there was this cliche in the UFO community that, oh, it's not the Air Force that has the lead on this, it's the Navy. Well, turns out they were right. So that's all you need. Absolutely, Nick. You're you're probably the nicest guy in um in the UFO community, if I, if I, <laughs> if I can say, an, an absolute oh, professional and very gen- generous with your time. Um, I was saying to my partner just before um we came on today that I'd spoken to you a few weeks ago. I had a couple of questions um uh, that I thought you might be able to help with, and you were just really kind and professional in the way that you responded. And I think that's a testament to to you and you know, having been in this community for such a long time. And so, I, you know, I thank you for that, uh, and thank you again for your time. Well, thank you. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Take care, Nick. Thanks again.